There are few monorails so cool, historic, and just overall useful that they justify a full YouTube video. But this one does, so I want to tell the story of a great transit project which has evolved with the times, as well as a changing city, and how I learned about all of this stuff in the first place. On the way, I'll teach you a bit about rail service planning, capacity, and even more. So let's get into it. Hey there, my name is Reese, and this is a YouTube channel where we sometimes say nice things about monorails. And today we're actually going to be talking about the Haneda monorail, which is sometimes better known as the Tokyo monorail, but Tokyo has a number of monorails, so I'll just call it the Haneda monorail. Now, before I go on talking about how great this monorail is, I have to address the elephant in the room. Monorails are not popular, and often for good reason. This transport technology sort of symbolizes for people everything that's wrong with the techno-futurist model of we need innovation before we actually just need good basic transportation services. At the same time, monorails are not standard railways, they don't use standard railway trains, and they have other problems, like being difficult to evacuate in an emergency, unless you like going down a slide. But they do, like all gadget bonds, have their redeeming qualities. For one, the guideways for monorails are, well, just the rails, making elevated structures thinner and less visually imposing than even the best designed traditional elevated rail. By making elevated rail less visually intrusive, they make it more socially and politically palatable to build, and that's probably a good thing. Monorails also do have the ability to wind steeper corners and climb steeper slopes than traditional urban rail lines, which gives them a bit more flexibility for urban environments. And while there isn't a standard monorail technology, the closest one to existing is from Japan by Hitachi and used in numerous Japanese and international monorail systems. My point here is that while monorails mostly aren't something to be emulated, in Japan it seems that transit service is seen as a universal good, and the approach taken with an unusual gadgety line like the Haneda monorail is something that the rest of the world could learn a lot from. But why does it exist in the first place? Well, like so many other transit projects around the world, from the DLR's second branch to Stratford, to the Canada Line that I love so much, to the Shinkansen system in Japan, the Haneda monorail is an Olympics legacy project, most notably from the Tokyo 1964 Summer Olympics. You see, the monorail was created for the games and for the legions of fly-ins who would be coming in from the airport as a form of early air rail link. That would take them from Haneda into the city to Hamamatsucho Station where they could connect to the Yamanote Line, a line I previously described as the most important rail line in the world. The monorail would do all of this while giving them stunning views of the Tokyo Metropolis and Tokyo Bay. And in fact, much of the line was actually built over water and various waterways, meaning that expropriation of private property didn't have to happen, and well, it's also just very cool. The line also has an extremely wacky underwater tunnel, and tunnels for monorails are weird, so that's kind of cool as well. But true success didn't come to the line until it stopped just being a shuttle to the airport and became more. Indeed, over the years as new islands were built in Tokyo Bay, new services and stations were introduced to serve new local residents and travelers. Albeit, some of these stations are looking a bit shabby these days, which isn't the greatest feature of this line. All of this has taken the Haneda monorail to a point where it moves nearly 150,000 people every single day, which would be a respectable number for the average subway line. This all happens along a roughly 18-kilometer 11-station route, running from the city along the shore of Tokyo Bay down to the airport. The lines become so popular that ANA, a major airline that uses Haneda Airport, actually even bought a stake in the monorail. But this success clearly isn't because the line is, ooh, a monorail. It's because it provides a good service, with a train on average every four or five minutes all day. In fact, despite having only a single track terminus at Hamumatsucho, and two tracks for the rest of the line, there's even express services which run non-stop from downtown to the airport. It's somehow not at all surprising to me that the place that has an express monorail would be Japan. But how do they actually do it, and how do I know how they do it? Time for a bit of a diversion. We need two things to understand how the monorail's express services work. And the first is everyone's favorite thing, graphs. More specifically, string diagrams. String diagrams are an incredibly powerful tool that can be used for rail service planning. Imagine we have a basic shuttle train line with three stations and two single track terminals at the end, as well as a double track station in the middle and a single train traveling back and forth. 
If it takes five minutes to run between stop at and prepare to depart from each station, then it's going to take the train 20 minutes to do a round trip of the line, and thus you can operate a 20 minute headway with a single train, which is actually not terrible. And this can be graphed on a string diagram as follows. Notice how the slope of the line between each point corresponds with the average speed of the train between those two stations. What if we want to increase the surface frequency though? Well, we can add another train starting at the opposite terminal. And each time the original line and this new line formed by the new train cross on the string diagram, well, we have a double track crossing opportunity at that middle station on the route. And we now have a service that runs every 10 minutes. We can actually expand this idea by upgrading to an every five minute service and putting trains at every single platform at the beginning of service. But there's a bit of a problem here. How do we figure out where to put those new passing tracks so that we don't have to fully double track the line while still providing a frequent service? Well, if you've been paying any attention, the answer is obvious. Use the string diagram and plot out those extra services and see where they intersect. Based on where they cross on the string diagram, that's where you need to add additional passing tracks. Now, of course, this is all a simplification, and in real life, you probably would just double track the route, but this type of careful service and infrastructure integrated planning is how we got marvelously affordable transit like the $20 million rapid transit line that is O-Train Line 2 in Ottawa. It's also basically at the center of the Swiss rail planning system. So that's the string diagram. The second important component to understanding how a service can or does operate is looking at the physical infrastructure. That's because the physical infrastructure of a railway is a reflection of the types of service that are possible on it. We can see that short of Hamamatsu Cho Station's single track, the rest of the Haneda monorail is double track, short of some extra storage tracks at Showajima where there is a maintenance depot. Now it's not at all uncommon to have a maintenance depot with extra track, or I guess rails in this case, next to the running rails for trains to accelerate or decelerate into and out of service or just park. But in this case, they're actually rather unique because they're bypass tracks for express trains. You see, we can actually whip out our newfound friend, the string diagram to see how this actually works. While trains traveling opposite directions on a string diagram cross like this, trains traveling in the same direction bypassing one another look like this. By referencing a schedule which the monorail actually operates on to ensure its express trains are actually express, the local trains depart the terminals just a few minutes before an express. And then by the time the express catches up, we're near Showajima Station, the only one that actually needs more capacity for trains to pass one another. You can see this looks awesome on the string diagram, with the slower trains clearly having a longer travel time and the faster ones having a shorter one. But there's actually something here that unveils a much more interesting learning. Notice how there's a lot of vertical space taken up on the diagram by these services? That's the visual representation of the fact that by mixing different service speeds, you more inefficiently use your rail capacity. Since the faster trains are catching up and using extra space, and the slower trains are falling behind, again using extra space. If every train ran at roughly the same speed, be it either slow or fast, then the space between the trains, i.e. the headways, and the space between the lines would be much smaller, allowing for higher capacity. And the Tokyo monorail actually does this. For the first few hours of the day, from around 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., there are a couple express trains an hour for the odd airport traveler who wants to go from downtown to the airport. But during rush hour, when residents along the line and who are potentially connecting to the line are headed to work, capacity is a priority. And so the service pattern changes so that there's only local service, no express trains at all. Then, as the schedule settles in for the midday and there isn't so much of a capacity crunch, the service pattern alternates between local and then express and then back to local. That actually means that there are three less trains per hour during the midday than during peak periods, but that's a price that's worth paying because far more riders get the express train experience. Towards the end of the day, the process essentially runs in reverse, with express services tapering off before ending completely at the end of service. The lessons here, and with the Haneda monorail in general, are many. For one, a great transit line rarely stays static. It adapts with time, but also with the city it serves, adding new stations and services to better serve its current demographic, as well as just making the best of what is essentially a gadget bond. 
there's also a huge lesson here to be learned about managing capacity and service. You can, and frankly should, run both express and local services on a double track line, and you can do that every couple of minutes. But it's valuable to understand the capacity trade-offs being made when you operate different service levels on a single rail line. All of that comes together to mean you can turn a wacky airport express train into the world's greatest monorail. Thanks for watching. A huge thanks to Luke Starkenberg for the fantastic footage used throughout this video.